distinguished guests, welcome to another episode of Life on the Grid, hosted by Kobe Lambert and Joe San Diego. Tonight we have Sabri Cook joining us, plus music from Ava Earl. Sit back and enjoy tonight's episode of Life on the Grid. Here's the Uptown Charlotte skyline from the WBTV webcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Life on the Grid. My name is Kobe Lambert from the Podium Finish. This is a special episode presented by Racers, the girls behind the helmet. We don't have just San Diego this month, but we do have one of our colleagues from our Thursday show, the Women Racing to Win, Daniel. Welcome. How are you doing today? Oh, hi, everyone. I'm really pretty, pretty good. Thanks. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, we're really glad to have you on here for a special episode during Women's History Month. If you, if you watch Grid Network programming on Thursday afternoons, then then you're familiar with Daniel's work alongside Joe to produce the Women Racing to Win, following the careers of many women racing all over the world. We, we don't see many media outlets specifically covering women in racing. Daniel and his team definitely stay on top of everything, providing top-notch coverage and shine the light on those drivers who might not get in-depth coverage. Otherwise, here's my first question for you, Daniel. What's the story behind Racers, the girls behind the helmet, the reason why you decided to do this? Oh, that's a great question. As you said, uh, there are not many media outlets focusing on, on women in motorsport. Uh, there certainly are some. Uh, the, some someone is, uh, is uh, now growing, uh, especially uh, social media pages. There are some really interesting ones. Uh, but I think so far we are one of the few uh, media outlets uh, to uh, specifically cover women in motorsport in, uh, and doing race reports and following them on track. Uh, so that it's something uh, that we do differently. Um, as you said, we our, our story began two years ago, uh, at least online, because our website uh, started in May in 2019. Uh, let's say that we we went online uh, after the when uh, the, the W series started. Uh, so we uh, decided to to focus on on the all female, the first ever all female championship, the W series. Um, even though I had been uh, focusing on women in motorsport and I have been advocating for women in the sport for quite some time, for quite some years, um, I would say that I was uh, not properly a racing driver. I, I used to, uh, racing cars uh, when I was uh, like uh, six, seven. Uh, so that's my first approach of motor racing here in Europe and especially in, in, in Italy where I'm currently based. Uh, karting is, is, is huge. There's a huge uh, industry in karting. The, most of the most important uh, teams and, and racetracks are uh, based here. Uh, so we've seen uh, a lot of, uh, of really important drivers uh, coming to, to race here in Italy. And I started at decent level to, uh, to race karts. Um, and one of the most uh, the, the, the most interesting stuff that I had noticed uh, it was that it was one of the very few sports where women and men uh, were competing together. And so, as as a young uh, boy, it was something that uh, fascinated me, and uh, I hoped uh, to really had um, a numerical uh, balance. And uh, when I saw that, yes, on paper we had a um, you know e equality. But still, the, the numbers were uh, hugely uh, imbalanced on, on the male part. I uh, started to think that, okay, maybe something has to be done to, to, to rebalance the, this stuff. And that's the first, uh, you know, the first time where I, I thought that, okay, maybe th there is something that can be done. Uh, then uh, um, I, I stopped racing because of, of course it's a hugely expensive sport and i didn't have the uh, the resources to uh, to go into uh, single seaters uh, which was ultimately the dream and the dream for everyone starting out in 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 karting especially at that age i would say um and so my my life went uh, on uh, on a different path and i um I, I found myself from the other side of the pit wall. Um, I did some work in motor racing, in uh, especially in, in sports marketing. And then in the media, I started to cooperate with, uh, with some me media outlets in, in Italy. Um, and that when, uh, yeah, after a couple of years, then I, I, I had some, some different uh, work. Um, and then when uh, the W series was announced, I thought, okay, it, it was a, a moment in my life when I uh, had uh, thought about coming back to motor racing because I, had, uh, I, I was away from, from the racetrack for some, some years. 
uh, I really want to to be back involved uh, in, in motor racing and the uh, creation of W Series really gave me uh, the opportunity to create a platform to speak uh, about uh, women in, in the sport. So I started this website uh, like a small uh, blog uh, just to, you know, to, to write out my ideas about uh, how uh, things were going in, um, for, for females in the sport. And then I started to involve some more people. Uh, I, we, we are currently a very small team, uh, but very focused and very passionate about that uh, or sharing, sharing the same values, both uh, men and, and females. And uh, yeah, that's how the project started. And uh, two years on, uh, we have been uh, um, traveling to, to racetracks. We've been following W Series in its inaugural season. And uh, unfortunately, 2020 proved to be a little bit, bit more challenging than we expected, but still we managed to follow some championships. And we are definitely hoping to do more in, uh, in this year. Yeah, definitely. You've had quite a journey to get to where you are today. And I know in a previous interaction we've had off camera, I remember you telling me about a time in the past when you were in the presence of a driver who is now developing to a superstar and a, glo and a, and a global icon on the motorsport scene. When, when you told me this driver's name, I got to be honest with you, it really stunned me. He's a current star in the NTT for Andretti Autosport, endurance driver for Wayne Taylor Racing in the IMSA endurance races and an Indianapolis 500 champion. Actually, in his first start in the greatest spectacle in racing, Daniel, how in the world do you know Alexander Rossi? Uh, that's uh, uh, that's nice to, that you mentioned that. Uh, Alex is. Uh, I, I'm I'm not so much in contact with with him anymore because, of course, as you said, he developed into this massive uh, uh, superstar of motor racing. Uh, but when he started out in uh, when he came into Europe uh, to to race, he was very young, and he was living here in Italy. Actually, he was living in Tuscany. And uh, of course, the, the, the European racing uh, scene is, is pretty small. Uh, it's like a small family, always uh, traveling together to, to, to all the championships. And, uh, and in particular, the, in, in Italy, uh, we all know each, each other from, from, from motorsport. And uh, he was uh, living here all by himself. Uh, of course, he had his family in, uh, in the US. Uh, his parents were still traveling to his races, but he was uh, living pretty much by himself here in Italy. And uh, yeah, I met him on, on, on track and he became uh, pretty, a, a good friend of mine, actually. Um, I, we, we, we traveled, uh, I, I went to, to see his races uh, when he was racing in, in Formula 3 and in the, the in World Series by Renault and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I think uh, he was probably one of the closest friends I had uh, in, in the paddock in uh, like more than 10 years ago, I would say. Then, of course, he went on uh, to, to race in, in the bigger championships in the in uh, GP2 and then Formula One. And then he came back to the US uh, and, and developed into this massive superstar. So uh, we're not that closed um, anymore, but still it was it was nice to share uh, some of the, of the times together. Yeah, definitely some great memories there. It's like, it's like, wow, I remember him when he was at this level. And now Alexander Rossi is this massive superstar in IndyCar racing. And, and it's definitely quite a, quite a feeling because I, I, I know, I know that, that feeling as well. Because when I was a freshman in college at UNC Charlotte just a few years ago, Anthony Alfredo, who's now racing a NASCAR Cup Series, we, we, we sat in the library together and talked about racing for like an hour. And, and I saw him a few times on campus. And it's and it's just really crazy when you knew them when like when Anthony Alfredo was coming up it, it was his first year in what is now called the Arkham Menard Series East and 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 he was just a young driver trying to prove himself in racing and now Alfredo is racing on Sundays in the NASCAR Cup Series with the likes of Chase Elliott, Kyle Busch, Denny Hamlin, Kevin Harvick. So so it's really crazy when you when you remember someone when they were at this point in their life and see what they've become. Alexander Rossi star in the IndyCar series and Anthony Alfredo now racing on Sundays for front row motorsports and at the cup level and looking ahead to the future for racers, the girls behind the helmet and the women racing to win every Thursday. What are your future goals for your outlet and, and partnership with us here at Grit Network? Well, first of all, I'm very happy that we started this co cooperation. Uh, we are doing this program together. I think it really uh, benefits both of us uh, to, uh, you know, expand these these programs. It also features uh, some of the uh, the news from from, from women uh, around the globe. Uh, we are trying to stay up to date to date and to. Uh, 
uh, you know, covered most uh, most of the championships. Uh, looking at the future, I think uh, uh, it's it's going to be interesting. To uh, one of one of my targets would be uh, probably to uh, grow the team a little bit. As I said, uh, we are still a, a three uh, people band here. Um, so I would like to to expand a little bit the team um, and uh, yeah, trying. I, I was just discussing it today with with uh, some of my uh, colleagues here. Uh, probably doing some more stuff in, into esports would be interesting. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to 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 develop our our cooperation further. And uh, I, I'm really really enjoying uh, taking part in in, in the programs with uh, the Grid Network. Yeah, Daniel, we're, we're, we're very fortunate, blessed, lucky to work with such a great young growing outlet like the ra racers, the girls behind them and partner with Grit Network. And as you mentioned, it's a partnership that benefits both of us and really excited to see w w what we're going to accomplish together for the rest of the young 2021 racing season and into the future as well. Because I think that the women racing the win is definitely going to continue growing over time. Grit Network is going to keep growing your your outlet is going to continue growing, and at the end of the day, everybody's going to be winners. Yeah, as as you said, uh, one of the um, one of the main targets is also going on track, uh, like we did in the past couple of years. Uh, so yeah, definitely this year we will be uh, trying to to go more on track. Um, last year, uh, uh, of course, despite all the difficulties, despite all uh, media's uh, having more uh, more of a hard time uh, having uh, accreditation, especially for such a, a small outlets like ourselves, um, we still managed uh, to to be trackside. So this is, uh, um, I would say, promising for the future uh, as things uh, go back to a little bit of a more normality. I would say. And we are really looking forward to um, to, to to bring you the, the, the news from uh, directly from the from the track because I, I ultimately think that when you're right there and you you know the people you're you're speaking about, that really makes the difference, and um, because you get to know to a whole, a whole different level, and uh, yeah, it, it really makes makes a big difference uh, compared to you know sitting behind your desk at your computer and uh, tweeting stuff, which is of course very important because some media work is always important, uh, but especially for, for for our work, which is a, a lot more about um, bringing awareness to to the general public to uh, to, to a topic like women in motorsport uh, that most maybe are, are is, is going unnoticed, uh, being there and knowing their stories and. Uh, uh, you know, um, telling their stories, uh, it makes, uh, it, it's what makes a difference. I, 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 at least I believe so. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things I really love about journalism is, is storytelling, storytelling, storytelling. It, in, in my, in my Friday class, sports, sports broadcasting and, and digital media, we talk about that all the time, how, how, how in this industry is, it's nothing but storytelling, and that's one of the, and that's one of the more, most beautiful things about it. And I and I know in a, a little bit our guest is gonna tell tell us her story and all of that. And is and I, I just really love journalism. That that's all I have to say about that. I've I've loved journalism since I was f five years old. You used to used to sit in my grandpa's lap, watch the ten o'clock news late at night before going to bed. And and I also looked at the newspaper as well, and, and people had no idea why I was so interested in stuff like that. I've just been fascinated about news and stories, and it's just really awesome and feel really blessed to be a part of this field. And I think it's time to introduce our guest for the month of March. To, uh, to business and with the today's uh, guests, uh, she, I'm very pleased to have her on, on the show. Uh, she's the 26-year-old uh, uh, racing driver from uh, the United States, from uh, precisely from Colorado, Grand Junction. Uh, she uh, was one of the two American drivers on the grid in the inaugural W Series season in 2019. Uh, she also won the Striving Forwards Award at the final uh, awards in, in the W Series. Um, she is um, also very interesting because she not only a racing driver, but she's also an engineer with uh, direct uh, experience of Formula One. Uh, in fact, she has won the Infinity Engineering Academy and uh, she has um, worked in the Renault Formula One team. So uh, I will be, ve I'm very excited to, uh, to, to have uh, Sabre Cook here on the show with us tonight. Hi, thank you guys for having me.
Thank you so much for your time, Sabre. Um, first of all, uh, how are you today? I'm great. How are you guys? Pretty, pretty good. Um, so. 2019, we uh, last time we spoke on uh, on on track, uh, yeah, we were at the W Series final race. Um, of course, it was a very uh, an exciting uh, season for for motorsport for women in in, uh, in motorsport in general. Uh, and I remember you gave yourself a seven out of ten in your uh, in, the, in in our uh, final uh, end of the season uh, review. Uh, and I, I definitely agree that it was very important first uh, first uh, year for uh, for you in the, in that series. Um, but now with the with the benefit of insight, um, is there anything that you would uh, do different uh, in from uh, from your uh, from your second season? Um, obviously, try to minimize mistakes uh, more than uh, than I did in twenty nineteen. Um, get better at qualifying, so I've been really focusing on that, making sure that's a priority. And um, but other than that, I think kind of taking the same mental approach, just trying to improve every session, um, focusing on the process and some of the results. And um, yeah, just just taking all that I applied in 2019 and pushing it forward to get a better um, better performance in uh, 2021. Of course, this year the W Series will be on on a bigger platform, uh, racing together with Formula One. So it, it will be also available to a new uh, audience that probably uh, didn't follow W Series in in 2019 and maybe the, uh, don't know the all the racers as well. So I would uh, I would ask you to introduce you to uh, an audience that maybe hasn't followed W Series before. Hi guys, my name is Saber Cook. Um, I'm a racing driver and mechanical engineer and driver coach uh, from the United States, born and raised in Grand Junction, Colorado. Um, I worked as an engineer uh, for Renault F1 as well in 2019 and Infinity Global um, because I won the 2018 um, US division of the Infinity Engineering Academy. Um, I had tons of success, a long karting career, and then moved to cars um, as a driver in 2017. Um, did a few USF4 races, USF 2000 races, then moved to W Series in 2019. Um, last year was, um, well, it was supposed to be W Series again, but there was COVID, so um, did, did the best that we could with the way things worked out. And uh, I was able to do a few Indy Pro 2000 races, some um, Formula um, Enterprise races, and then also did um, some GT2 races. Then this year did a couple GT2, did the MX5 race at Daytona. And I will set for W Series grid again this year in 2021. That was a very good uh, roundup of your your career so far, but we will go in detail through uh, any any points now. Uh, I also remember that uh, in one of our interviews in 2019, you also told us that uh, you had a pretty good uh, karting career, as you as you mentioned. Um, your switch from karting to single seaters wasn't maybe as easy. Uh, as some of the other drivers had, uh, especially such, uh, I, I mean, after the, all, all the track time that you could, you could have in, in, in karting, because uh, as you mentioned, your dad had a, a racing track, is that correct? Yes. Uh, so yeah, coming into, into your first year in, in Formula 3, after uh, a few races, you were uh, straight in the mix uh, in, in, in the battles and uh, up, up in the, in the order, uh, so that was very good in the higher end of the classify. Uh, what were your expectations coming into the W Series before the, the, the season started? Um, I guess I didn't really know what to expect going into 2019 because that was my first full season um, in, you know, professional open wheel series. I hadn't had the funding previously and races I did and, you know, USF4 and F2000 the year before was, you know, a couple here, a couple there. Um, so I wasn't sure how I was going to stack up, but I just knew that it was, it was going to be a challenge because I'd never been to any of the tracks. And so I just, I guess I didn't really, I said, I'm like, okay, if I can finish in the points, great. Let's let's go for that and just um, have good performance. And the, I guess my main goal was really the progression over the season, not so much, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to finish fifth this race. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that after a couple of uh, maybe more difficult uh, two races, you had a great race in Misano, uh, great comeback uh, through through the order. And after that, I think you really progressed in, into the second half of the of the season and making a lot more improvements. Uh, were there any moments where you really uh, understood something more about the car or maybe about your approach? 
Um, I guess I, I really, things really click for me on how to get a good start in ASIN. Um, mm -hmm. And then I guess in ASIN as well, just like with the, it's like medium to high speed flowing sections, just like learning more how much I can lean on the car and then how much more low the tires could actually take laterally. Um, other than that, I guess, yeah, that, I guess those were probably my two, two big moments throughout mm -hmm. the season. You also had the podium finish in, in the reverse grid race uh, in, in Aston, which was probably one of the most exciting races that, uh, that you, you can remember. And if any of the, uh, of the viewers online has not seen that uh, already, uh, I highly suggest you to check it out on, on the W Series uh, YouTube channel because it's one of the most exciting motor races that I can remember. And I also think, uh, but that's uh, just uh, maybe my memory, uh, you were also in the top three in Norris String in uh, uh, in practice is that correct yes okay that's uh, so my memory doesn't play games uh uh it's, it's something uh, that racing in, in street circuits uh is, is do you like that yeah i i actually really enjoy street circuits especially i think it comes from maybe the karting because we did uh, a few street races here like especially in um, california we used to do one outside of denver as well so i i guess maybe that's why i, I enjoy it Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously the the 2020 season uh, uh, was about to start, and uh, the you know we had that uh, year that changed everything and a, a lot of things. Um, and the W Series 2020 got cancelled, of course. We also spoke with other drivers from W Series uh, uh, that they all had, of course, uh, uh, they were feeling disappointed, of course, but it was something that uh, we kind of knew already when the decision uh, arrived, uh, because, of course, as an international series, you know, it was pretty much impossible at that point to... Uh, yeah, so what, what was the first time, your reaction for the, when you learned the decision wasn't going ahead? Uh, I mean, obviously everyone was disappointed that we weren't racing in real life last year, but um, other, other than the disappointment, I mean, I, I really understand like with the circumstances and situations, like everything, it's, it just wasn't feasible. And I really respect how W Series still tried to keep, you know, keep our names out there, keep W Series alive and did the esports racing. So I think it was, it was probably the best um, alternative situation that we could have yeah, I agree. Also, uh, being uh, you know a very young series that could have been a really um, you know could put them in in a dangerous position because uh, um, you know having a stop here just after one season, uh, but they handled it very well. I completely agree with you, Saber. Um, but also. Uh, as you said, it wasn't feasible, the, the, the racing, um, we were in a major health crisis and everyone understood that. Uh, but also our lives, our everyday lives has a little bit changed and maybe we don't understand yet how things have changed. Uh, how was 2020 for you? Yeah, 2020 was interesting. Um, I guess it became more just like rolling with the punches and um, just like being always being ready for change. Um, it wasn't obviously what what we'd all expected. I, I was going to do W Series and then do at least a first institution in Indy Pro and sponsorship fell through for that. So I only did two races for those. But um, it was it was good in other areas. I feel like I had a little more extra time to work on like self growth, personal development. So I really enjoyed that. And then um, got time to do a bunch more coaching and development with young drivers. So I, I really enjoyed that as well. Um, and then at the end, started working with Formula Maza, which is where I'm currently on right now, sitting in the office. Um, so it was like a year of change and it was a year of like, just kind of like flying by the seat of your pants, but that's kind of how racing is anyway. So I think it's, it prepared me well for, for 2020 <laughs> and uh, just tried to make the best of it in any way that I could. Yeah, true. Uh, also, your training routines, I think, uh, would have changed a little bit because, of course, uh, um, I, I don't know how it worked in, in the US, but uh, here in, in Europe, for example, there were gym closed, um, yeah. people struggling a little bit to, to going through their training routines. How was it for you? So, yeah, for us, the gyms were closed for a few weeks in the beginning in Colorado. Um, so obviously, once everything shut down, I went back to my home base in Colorado and we were lucky that after a few weeks, our gym did reopen, but it was obviously you had to wear a mask while working out, which is sometimes a little 
a little uh, difficult when you're doing hard intense cardio. Um, but it, I was I was honestly one of the fortunate ones because even if our gyms did when they did close down for a week or two, and then they maybe closed down intermittently. I was able to use like workout equipment that either I had at home or my parents had at home. So I was, I was really lucky in, in that situation and I had my road bike, so I could still, you know, right outside. So it was um, much better uh, off than I'm, I'm sure a lot of other people were where they still haven't, they haven't been into a gym in like a year. So I, I definitely feel for, for a lot of people. I know I had one of my good friends just told me the other week, he's like, I'm finally going back to the gym after an entire year. And I'm like, man, I don't know how I would have made it through if I couldn't have gone. Yeah, we, we just literally spoke with uh, Tasmin Pepper, and uh, she also told us about her experience in in this. Um, and of course, racing drivers are always very uh, goal oriented people, and uh, they always uh, work with a short term goal in mind. And uh, that with a one year stop in in racing, uh, did it make any difference for you psychologically? Um. I mean, other than I had more time to kind of, I guess, like work on my mental toughness, work on my mental growth, I think, I mean, I think it was a positive. Mm -hmm. Also, in 2020, uh, the, the, the biggest winner probably was eSports. And uh, W Series had the uh, the esports league, of course. Um, you, you did that championship, must, but also you uh, you're doing uh, sim work uh, apart from from uh, racing online. Is that correct? Uh, I am associated with Cranfield Simulation, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a, a lot more uh, on the engineering side and, and uh, setup oriented, I, I would say. Um, tell us a little bit about the differences of uh, probably racing online and doing proper sim work. Uh, you mean like driving in a, in a full proper sim, like the one that is full motion and everything like that Cranfield has? Yeah, exactly. So I guess, so Cranfield Sim is absolutely amazing. It has airbags like in the seat. So not only does the platform move itself, but it, it kind of simulates the sort of sensations you get with G-forces, et cetera, when you're driving. Um, I mean, it's, it has full, like full on wheel and pedals that's realistic to what's actually in the real car. Um, and then they actually utilize VR a lot of the time. Um, so that's, that's something that's very, um, it, it's different and you're like inside, obviously inside the game. Um, and so I guess with that sort of sim work, it becomes much more applicable to, to real life because every all the sensations are much closer to what you're actually going to feel in the car. Um, when you just do, you know, sim racing online where you've got, you know, just like the basic pedals and wheels and there's no motion and so then it, it, it's just different and it, you rely on different senses sometimes, like at least with the sims that move, um, you have a little more feedback on how the sim is moving and take that into account on how you drive the car. And then with no motion, just at home, um, you know, you're more reliant on your vision and um, just like you're sort of like you learn how fast the wheels track and what, what your inputs do. You're more reliant on like the wheel input and everything like that. So um it's yeah it's different but i think both are great for driver development and they both have um you know very effective drills that you can do on each of them but nothing in the end replaces real some time mm, yeah definitely uh i mean from from a racer point of view i think uh, that you always uh are very much reliant also on the feedback from from your seat from from uh um yeah for, from your back uh so that's something very different in in, in sim racing in, in simulation work at least uh but now we are seeing a lot more drivers uh, going from from the online uh, uh community to going into real cars uh do you think this is a uh a, a feasible pathway for for motor racing of, of course we know it's a very expensive uh uh, to, to start out and maybe uh, there is some very talented uh, uh, girls or guys that are missing out because they don't have the uh, the resources to, to start and maybe sim racing is, is probably a solution to uh, to approach this this environment but is it do you think is it possible to make a full switch? I mean, it's definitely possible. I've, I've already seen people do it. Uh, I mean, years ago, I think it was like they had, it was a PlayStation that had a program where 
if you finished um, in a certain position on their, their series online that you got a, a ride in the Pirelli World Challenge in a, in a GT car. And I think that guy, he got in and, and did really well. So people have definitely done it. Um, I think that, you know, it's going to be different when you when you convert to real life. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of learning curves, like you can't just push reset and there's a lot more sensations that you're going to feel. But it's really impressive to me to watch some of the sim drivers that never really have done much real life driving jump in and actually do really, really well. So there's there, that, I mean, that right there is proof that it, it can, there can be a crossover and people could start sim racing and then maybe use some of the scholarships or programs out there that are available with the esports stuff to then maybe get into a, into a real race car in the future. Uh, I don't think that's going to, I mean, I don't see that transitioning to being like the main theater for people getting into racing, but I think it will definitely continue to grow and be taken more seriously. Mm -hmm. Great points you made there. Uh, you also mentioned, uh, of course, that last year yeah, you were set to race in the in the Pro 2000. Uh, you just like did a couple of, of, of races, if I'm not mistaken, um, because of course of the whole situation that uh, that went on. Um, and people usually, I, I'd say, that do not grasp all the work that is done uh, behind to secure a seat, that is hidden behind a deal. Uh, what uh, tell us a little bit more about that, and what suggestion would you? Uh, would you say to, to a young girl probably starting out now regarding sponsorship and how do you approach uh, uh, stuff like that? All, all the work that, that goes unnoticed most of the time. Well, yeah, that you're right about that. The most of my time <laughs> is spent is spent doing that. Um, just before this call, I you know I was on a call for an hour and a half, I'm going back and forth on a on a proposal with a company that we're working with. So it's. It's a, and then you talk to the lawyers and you go through everything. So it's it consumes the majority of your time. Um, I guess for people that are getting into racing, the, the best advice that I can give is don't be afraid to go introduce yourself and make connections to people. Like if you're around a racetrack, go, you know, introduce your guy, introduce yourself to the people pitted next to you or, um, you know, just, just pay attention to who's around you. Keep in mind, like how it's funny how little connections can lead to something like amazing. Like you could meet someone in passing in an elevator, and that's like a connection that's going to turn into a half a million dollar sponsorship later down the road. So, just always put your best foot forward. Um, always carry business cards um, and utilize, you know, like LinkedIn. Go to events like PIR, SEMA. Go to races. Introduce yourself to teams. To sponsors just be present because i mean if you're not there if you're not making the connections and you're not engaging then it's going to be a heck of a lot harder um and so i had to learn that the hard way um but yeah those those would be my my top tips make sure you have a good business card good website good presentation and just keep in mind that anybody that you meet could be a potential connection or friend or mentor down the road yeah, absolutely. Um, and you, you're absolutely correct with uh, the, the, the connections. And uh, one of the connections that you made in, in W Series probably uh, brought to you, I'm not sure if that's the only reason, but one of the reasons uh, to uh, sit in, uh, in the Mazda Championship. Is that correct? Yeah, so yeah, that, that is, see, so like that, that is partially how that deal came about was because I had met Shay through W Series. So then I was lucky enough for her to, for her to be like, hey, you know, we got this race coming up. Do you want to be a part of it? And uh, it ended up being a, a really great experience. And the fact that she was team manager and I got to see her and her whole new element was really cool too. Yeah, that's very cool that you're teaming up after being, you know, the two Americans on the grid in, uh, in W Series. And tell us a little bit more about, uh, of course, the, the Mazda uh, race that you did in Daytona and you've, uh, if you're going to be competing uh, in, uh, in the whole season. Uh, yeah, so the MX-5 Cup race I did at Daytona uh, was a ton of fun. It was some of the closest racing that I've been a part of since my karting days. So it was like the top like 13 of 13 or 14 of us were like right together at the finish line for the first race. And it was just it was it was absolutely a joy to be a part of, really. So um, I, I would like to do more races um, as it's set right now. I'm not scheduled to be in another MX-5 race this year. 
Um, I mean, that could always change, uh, but it was uh, it was definitely some really enjoyable racing. Uh, yeah, that, that was indeed one of the closest racing that I've ever seen. Um, and uh, of course, now races uh, in 2020, now also in 2021, probably will still see uh, like not a full uh, people, full grandstands uh, with audience. Uh, Doesn't that make any difference to a race car? I mean, I guess it's just less mm, less uh, commotion going on around you. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, the objective is still the same. It's still to go out there, do your best, win the race. So it doesn't, I mean, for us, it doesn't change. Okay, it doesn't change a whole lot in regards to our performance on track. But then it does change a lot in regards to sponsorship. Because then um, you have these situations where sponsors are, it's harder for them to come to the track and get activation at the track, um, through networking, um, exposure through fan, you know, the fans being there. So in that regard, it does make a really big difference for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also uh, talked about this with the Formula 3 uh, team also last year. Uh, and they mentioned the same thing, that it's it's the most important thing that they, they struggle uh, to uh, with, with sponsors. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, also, um, what do you think that uh, uh, the, the 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 Shea Holbrook uh, being the, uh, the the team principal also of the team that you are racing with? Um, you are so also part of the Shift Up Now collective. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit more about this uh, this group of very talented people. Then, uh, yeah. So Shift Up Now is basically a collective of. I'm not going to say just women because we have plenty of men that are actually members. So that's pretty cool. Um, but it's, it's a lot of like female racing drivers and people involved in the motorsports industry that are basically banded together and are trying to support each other and support the future, future generations moving up through, you know, through the karting, open wheel, closed wheel, sports car, whatever, just moving up the ladders through, the, to, through to the top level in motorsports. And so we try to provide, like, you can get a membership and then you have access to discounts that we get access to, you know, with our sponsors, our partners. Um, we offer, like, webinars. Um, we just did one this last weekend, actually, for all the people that are looking on how to get into racing and ones that are maybe already involved in racing but not sure like what are the next steps so we literally spent like over two hours going through and talking to all of these people and like really just trying to give them a personal answer on what we think that they you know they should do next in their career so we, we try to give back as much as we can and then like you know Che and Pippa and, and myself like we try to give advice or mentor you know the younger ones that are coming into the Shift Up Now program and uh, it's just, yeah, it's basically just like one big group of people just trying to support each other and move forward in the world. And here we have Kobe uh, popping up on the screen and he has some more questions for you. Yes, yeah, so I really interested just a little while ago listening to you two talk about the Mazda race at Daytona in January. And I, and I remember that race really well. It was a lot of fun watching those Mazdas draft and bump draft around the high banks of Daytona. So definitely a lot of fun Def and definitely looking forward to that race once again next year. Saber, you grew up in Colorado, starting with karting, then competitive racing, traveling to race in different regions all around the country, plenty of tr plenty of different tracks. And myself being familiar with NASCAR, I know a lot, I know a lot of the racers who who are a part of NASCAR, they live in the Charlotte area in North Carolina. And there's a little saying, if you want to be a NASCAR, you have to move to Charlotte. No if, if ands, or buts. And for open and for American open wheel racing, I don't know for sure if you have to live in the Hoosier State to get on the road to Indy, but I'm sure you'll enlighten me on that subject in a bit. One of the coolest things about being a race car driver is good to travel and see different parts of the world you might not see otherwise in high school. My teachers always told us to see the world outside of our small town in North Carolina is definitely a good thing to see the world from a different perspective in comparison to being someone who might be more closed minded because they haven't experienced something new, exciting, different, and sometimes a little scary. At the end of the day, we can't forget where it came from. Home will always be home no matter where we go in life. And here's my first question for you. What's the racing scene like for aspiring racers in Colorado? And how did that influence your direction in motorsports towards SCCA and open wheel competition? Uh, so right now, I think the karting scene in Colorado definitely 
Um, unfortunately, it isn't what it, what it was when I was a kid. I was very lucky that it was more in its heyday and there we would get like hundreds of carts coming to, you know, like a local state race or a club race or, so it was, it was a great time to, to be involved in that as a kid. Um, I, you know, we raced like Chase Elliott grew up racing him because his parents, you know, they, they had a house in Vail and he would come down and race with us. So I was very lucky that, um, that we had good competition and, and lots of carts on track. Um, now it's unfortunately gone down a little bit with the numbers um, and people usually end up traveling out of state a lot for racing. But um, I, I mean, the karting is still there. The tracks are still there. Um, except for one, one, one closed down, but they're, they're still, um, I mean, the asphalt is still available. Um, now it's just more like, I guess a lot more people are traveling outside to go race, you know, on the West coast or in Midwest to, to get on the national series. But I mean, we ended up doing that as well. So for people growing up in Colorado now, I'd say, you know, get into the local karting scene. Um, once you're comfortable there and, you know, you've learned some of the basics, then graduate up into, into the, national karting scene and then uh, work on getting into you know an introductory open wheel or sports car series depending on which direction you want to go for me because i i, I loved karting and i also was um got really into shifter kart racing so with the shifter carts i think i guess like because of the shifter carts i just got really um passionate about open wheel and so I, I stuck with that and that's, you know, and then I found out about F1 and learned more about that when I was about 16. And so I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is a pretty cool um, upper level of motorsports. And so I think I just learned about that and then learned about IndyCar and decided that that was what I wanted to do. And like, as a kid, obviously, like, I think they, they go the fastest. So I was like, oh, well, that must be the best. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of like, my little child brain choosing which one I wanted to do. But in the end, it ended up being exactly what I wanted to do anyways. So that is, uh, that's how I got to where it was. Yes, you've definitely been on quite a journey to get to where you are today in the W Series. And and I had no idea that Chase Elliott raced out there in Colorado. And I'm sure that was definitely a really cool experience racing Chase Elliott, especially looking at where he is today. He's, he's a NASCAR Cup Series, cha Cup Series champion, won the championship last year trying to go back to back this year in 2021. And Chase had a, definitely had an eventful off season, running the Snowball Derby at Five Flat Speedway, the Chili Bowl out in Tulsa, and then the Rolex 24 with Action Express racing at Daytona. So definitely re really, really cool story there. Chase Elliott come out there to race you guys in Colorado. And, w and when you look at some of the differences in terminology in America and Europe, when it's time to service a car in America, they say bring it to pit road. In Europe, they say, a box box this lap and looking at the car's handling over here they say tight and loose with the exception of series like indycar open wheel race in the proper terms are understeer and oversteer and i gotta be honest with you grow, growing up watching a lot of nascar i'm used to tight and loose and when i whenever i hear oversteer and understeer every single time i have to go on the internet and see what it translates to for some re for some reason it still will not stick in my brain what understeer and oversteer is <laughs> yeah but I'm, I'm trying i'm trying to learn it but it might take a few more years for it to finally get drilled into my brain. And instead of hanging out in the garage before a race, as they did in normal times before the pandemic in America, the, the drivers are in the paddock on the other side of the pond. Another different thing that is brought to attention is the environment. When drivers leave Europe and come to the States after chasing a Formula One career, we often hear stories about their experience. They usually say in Europe is a little more self-centered environment. You want to be faster than your teammate, prove why you deserve to be there and be the last one standing. While everyone around you worries about their future in the series. And it's no secret that it can be a very cutthroat environment, not just over in Europe, but motorsports in general. And it's like perform, you get to stay around a lot longer and don't perform and they'll have another driver ready to take your seat. So there's definitely a lot of pressure on drivers in Europe, America, all over the world. And in America, it's considered more laid back and open, but pressure still exists. Like I mentioned, anywhere in racing, you can mingle, be friendly with your teammates, but you still have the arrivals on the track. And after his first IndyCar, IndyCar test, Roman Grosjean, said it took him by surprise to get to Barber Motorsports Park and see the cars being set up right in the open, not the type of privacy or secrecy you'll see in Formula One. Grosjean even mentioned chatting with Takuma Sato and Sebastian Bourdais, where in Formula One, you'll likely get the debrief with the engineer team and move on to the next thing with the tight schedule. And when it came to the W Series, traveling to Europe, racing in Europe, how different was the culture when you compare the American and European racing scene? 
Um, I definitely have to say that motorsports in, in Europe in general is like our football or baseball. Like motorsports is really a part of their culture. So it that's, I think, maybe why it's people are more cutthroat or something like that, that um, they just, it's so important to them and so important to, um, I guess, their, their way of life. And it, like, I mean, you see in Italy, like Ferrari is like, basically like, <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's almost like being American. Like <laughs> It's just part of who they are. Um, so that I think that was the, the big difference. Um, I mean, other than, I mean, the racing is aggressive on both platforms. I wouldn't say one is more than the other, um, but there's definitely more people involved in motorsports in, in the European market. And so that's why, you know, the, the, uh, the industry is much more saturated. Yeah, it definitely seems like there's a there's a lot of passion for for motorsports in Europe, and there are also different types of racetracks in both parts of the world. European tracks are usually smooth, high speed flowing circuits. Some classes over there, including Spa Franker Chops, Silverstone, Monza, Hockenheim, Imola, a few oval tracks, but mostly road courses. And and of course, the famous Formula One Monaco Grand Prix Street Circuit. It's often said that a lot of American racetracks are old school, have a lot of character, a mix of high and low speed corners. But some do have European characteristics like Watkins Glen in upstate New York and Circuit of the Americas. Other great tra tracks in the United States like Road America, Mid Ohio, Sebring, Road Atlanta, Laguna Cinco, just to name a few. Of course, ovals like the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, home of the greatest spectacle in racing, the Daytona International Speedway, home to the Daytona 500 and the Rolex 24 hour race. Another super speedway, Talladega, which produces tight action and huge multi-car crashes. Mile and a half tracks like Homestead Miami Speedway, which, which NASCAR was at. And in Texas, Charlotte Motor Speedway. Then you have your short tracks, Martinsville, Bristol, Five Flat Speedway. Also many dirt tracks all, all, all across the country. I'm not sure if they have a lot of dirt tracks in Europe. The most popular ones here are Eldora and Knoxville. What similarities and differences have you experienced between the tracks on both sides of the pond? Uh, I get asked that question a lot, and honestly, like, every racetrack is different. Every racetrack has its own little niche characteristics. Like, I wouldn't, I guess necessarily I wouldn't say I, if I woke up, if I was blindfolded and got dropped off at a racetrack, that I could tell you if it was in just based purely off the racetrack. I don't know if it would be possible to tell you if it was European or American, honestly. Like, they... Maybe sometimes I want to say like we get a lot of elevation change sometimes in the U.S., but then they have the same thing over in Europe, and it it's just there. Every track is unique, so it's it's hard to say like oh yeah, American tracks are high and low speed, European tracks are fast. Like it's totally not the case. Yeah, yeah. And one follow up question, right quick. Do you do you have a favorite racetrack in Europe and America? Um, I've never raced on Laguna Seca, but I would like to, um, in Europe that I, that I've raced on before, um, uh, I would say right now Brands Hatch was pretty, uh, enjoyable to, to race and drive on. Yeah, definitely. I, I remember, um, the, the, the Brands Hatch race at the, at the end of, uh, 2019 was one of the favorites, uh, one of the favorite uh, circuits that most of, uh, of you, uh, mentioned. Uh, speaking about 2020 again, uh, it wasn't all about racing yourself. As you, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, you also coached, uh, some, some young drivers. Uh, and you spent quite a lot of time in Mexico, I think, uh, coaching. Um, how was this, uh, this experience for you? And does it feel natural to, to teach to uh, young drivers uh, the, the secret of, uh, of, your, um, of, of what you do? Uh, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Uh, I always I actually really enjoy coaching and working with other drivers and trying to pass on the knowledge that I have learned through trial and error over the years and through the great mentors that I've had over the years. So just try to, I, I guess my goal is to pass along enough information so that the drivers don't make the same mistakes that I did and um, they learn from mine. So I actually, yeah, I really enjoyed working in Mexico. I mean, the people there are always very, like, passionate and friendly and it's it's interesting to see always like a you know a different way of living um but yeah it's uh coaching is definitely one of uh, one of the things i enjoy mm -hmm. 
And of course, uh, also having that engineering background, your uh, your coaching must be very valuable also on, on, on both of the perspective, both on, on the driving and engineering side, I think. Uh, what are the critical points, the most common mistakes that uh, maybe you, you see in someone start just starting out and how do you, uh, how do you work um, to correct that? Um, I guess most people that start out struggle with um, being consistent, like picking a breaking point, like or picking, pick, just picking reference points in general. They'll go out and they'll do one corner one way one lap, and then the next lap it's like a whole different thing. So that's a uh, for for that you just you know you just got to get someone to pick a reference point and just be consistent, and then build up and see how different approaches feel. Um, then another big thing, especially with young drivers, is they don't look ahead enough. Um, they kind of like, you know, their vision, they're like, they look five feet ahead of them and that's, that's about as far as they go. So correcting that is just really making the objective for the session to, to go out and on purely focus on that in the session. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating stuff. And also, uh, when you, uh, Kobe uh, bef mentioned before uh, the, uh, the difference in, in racing tracks, uh, when you, when you of course, came here in, in Europe, uh, you have never raced in, in any of the circuits that you, uh, you went to with W Series. Uh, how do you approach a new track when, uh, when, you are, uh, when you're preparing for a race, for example, and how, how that makes any difference for uh, maybe when you're coaching, uh, you, when, you, when you're trying to, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to make the, the, the young drivers learn that the same things? Uh, when I'm going to a new track, I will obviously watch like a bunch of onboard video, whatever I can get, whether it's from the teams or on just online. Um, I'll look at the track map and just try and like visualize laps in my head going through the track. So that way I know which way to turn left or right when I get there. Um, but then sim, that's where this really comes in is driving the tracks on the sim if it's available. Um, especially on the Cranfield Sim. I did that before every single W Series race in 2019. And I think that that made a huge difference because I, you know, I've never seen the track before. So me, it just like with our, you know, limited track time, being able to get in and, and perform quickly was really important. So I'm really thankful to Cranfield for that. Um, other than the Sim and obviously watching video and then doing a track map, I'll like have sort of a, I'll do a debrief, obviously, within it with my engineer, or um, maybe I'll get some information beforehand, and I'll kind of like make a starting track map and just make some quick notes um, about like things I think are going to be important, or you know, breaking references, um, apex references, stuff like that. Just basically gathering as much information as I possibly can, uh, and then obviously walking the track before you drive the track is very essential because things will look a lot different um, in a video, in a sim, um, than once you get out and actually walk the racetrack in real life. Mm -hmm. I remember in 2019 that I did the uh, the track walk at Norris Ring, and it was really uh, it was really interesting to see all the difference in uh, even in the curbs, you know, for uh, for all the points where uh, uh, you can maybe touch the, the, the curb here. Here, it's better not to, to stay away from that. It's really interesting. Uh, it was one of the uh, the first time that I had the opportunity to to do the track walk. Um, I, I wanted to also to show a picture here. If uh, if if Joe can uh, can help me with that. Uh, it's it's a picture that I took of you in uh, in Misan. Or well, then no problem. Uh, it, it's um, when when you were going through. Um, I, I think you were sitting on, um, on in the paddock and you were with eyes closed uh, with uh, the uh, music in your ears just before the race. You were going through the uh, um, the track in, in your mind, and you were also I think with your feet uh, doing the re rehearsing the the, the track. Uh, Talk us through your um, um, your pre-race moments. Uh, so for pre-race, I will do kind of what you said. I will um, sort of, I guess, find a quiet space if, I, if one is available and do, you know, run laps in my mind and, and basically visualize a perfect lap and think about what I need to do to change the way I was performing in the last session. Like, okay, I need to break later here, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll run through laps doing them correctly. Um, then, uh, or if it's before a race, I'll try and visualize starts as well. Um, then after I do the visualization and I feel like I know what I need to do, um, then I'll do like a physical warm up. So, um, I mean, in 2019, we had hints of there that, 
uh, was available for us to use before every race. So that was really, really helpful. And just, and then so we warmed up like our muscles, um, stretched a little bit and warmed up our reactions, like cognitive function. So that's um, a really key important to getting good performance on track because I mean, no athlete in the world just like decides they're just gonna go, you know, run their event. So everyone properly warms up. And so I think it's important for racing drivers to do the same. Mm -hmm. And also a lot of drivers uh, listen to music before, uh, before the start of the race. Uh, do you have any uh, like favorite stuff that you that you listen to? Um, we we spoke with Jamie Chadwick this year when uh, she was racing in the Formula Regional European Championship, and I had I, I got the opportunity to follow that championship. And she said that she uh, curiously uh, listened to the cinematic orchestra, which is a class <laughs> like classical music with, with piano. That's that's really interesting because uh, while some others maybe are more into the hard rock stuff, you know, stuff like that. Uh, do you have any any preference or, or at all? I think it depends, um, I guess, on my mental state and maybe where, what I feel like is going to best induce me to get into zones. Maybe if I'm feeling a bit low energy. I'll do something a bit more positive and upbeat, or if I feel like I need to be really focused and serious, maybe I'll do something a bit more like, I don't know, intense. Like I, I literally have a playlist on Spotify called Kick Ass, so I, I will play <laughs> that. Um, uh, but I will, I actually will listen to classical music too, as because um, to, it kind of like, it stimulates so many different parts of your brain and it sort of focuses you, kind of centers you and gets you in a very like, I don't know, peaceful and focused, the state so uh, I'll, I guess I just use what I I try to read myself read my body and know what I need and then listen to something based on that or sometimes I won't even listen to music because I'm you know doing my visualization and my warm-up and I'm doing like mantras and stuff and so that is uh that is enough for me and I, I don't have to listen to music mm -hmm. and do you have any uh, rituals. I mean, some, some drivers, uh, for example, like to enter the car always from the same uh, side of the car or stuff like that. Do you have any any of this? Uh, I don't really, in particular, on what side I enter because sometimes it's always not like it's not uh, convenient to always enter from the same side. <laughs> so, uh, but I do always put on my right shoe first, and I always put on my right glove first. Ah, oh, that's cool. Um, and for, for anyone not familiar with the W Series, you're also uh, always working with different engineers and mechanics and also chassis. Um, how was that for you? Oh, I, I really enjoyed it because then I guess it was a challenge on learning how new people worked and how you could um, gather information from different people. And so I had, you know, some guys that were young and they were really good with the data and, and sort of the... I guess the, the integration bit of that. And then you had older guys that were, you know, had so much experience and just like, they just, they just, they could explain to you like sort of their methodology, why they do things. And they were just so willing to share their, um, their experiences and, and help us. So it was a, it was a good experience basically from both spectrums. And, and I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the W Series approach, another interesting one was the open data approach. Uh, after the, the sessions, you all had access to, to the data from, uh, from the, leader, the session leader, I think. Um, do you think that this can potentially be replicated in other feeder series? I mean, I, I think it, it really does it gets an, an opportunity to, to young drivers to, uh, to grow. Um, I think it can. I mean, it already has actually. So I think it's USF4 here. Mm -hmm. You, the teams get data of whoever was the fastest in the session. So I think it's definitely possible. It's just a matter of if the uh, sanctioning body wants to implement it. And then always, you know, there's a bit of a gray area because, you know, W Series is run by the same team. Yeah. So technically we're all like operating within the same, uh, <laughs> I guess, like, budget like source so then for other teams like you know they've obviously worked really hard and they um put a lot of effort and time and money into getting their data getting their setups so then i get like why in other series where there's multiple teams operating why it's a bit harder to to have that open data because teams are very protective over the foundation that they've built yeah absolutely and here we have some more questions from kobe 
Yes, Saber. Daniel tells me that you're very fond of the NTT IndyCar series. I know you've competed in several USF 2000 races in 2018, then in 2020 last year, several races in the Indy Pro 2000 championship, as Daniel mentioned earlier. And good thing you were able to get some seat time last year with the W Series taking a year off because of the global pandemic. The USF 2000 series and Indy Pro 2000 are part of the road to Indy ladder system. Next step after that is Indy Lights, then finally moving up to IndyCar competition. In your opinion, What's the most attractive thing about IndyCar racing? Uh, I guess the most attractive thing about IndyCar racing is you get to do ovals and road courses, and the competition is very close. So you can have, you know, eight different race winners within the first eight races, whereas F1 is usually dominated by one or one to three teams. So I, I like that aspect of it, that it, it, well, it's not a spec series, it's more spec than, than F1 is. So it kind of brings the field together and obviously it races in the U.S. It's a pretty amazing track, so I like it for that reason as well. Yeah, definitely a lot of parody in IndyCar, as you mentioned. If, if there's a Formula One race tomorrow, everybody's probably going to be like, Lewis Hamilton's going to win, or if Lewis or if Lewis isn't going to win, is 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 probably it's probably going to be a, a red Red Bull or, his t or Lewis's teammate Valtteri Bottas. So we'll see if Ferrari can get back into the picture this year. It's going to be interesting to see how they do it. Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz later in the season. I know we I know you mentioned the, the oval tracks. I know some drivers have mixed feelings about oval tracks. Some pe some people love ovals and some and, and some drivers are very hesitant about the ovals. I know Max Chilton, he started off his IndyCar career racing on all of the ovals. And then when Robert Wickens had his terrible crash at Pocono, he decided to do something called what he what he referred to as risk management and decide to only race the Indianapolis 500 only and skip out on the rest of the ovals because he just wasn't worth the risk to him, and and in recent com in, in recent comments from children at IndyCar Media Day, he said there's a there's other IndyCar drivers who have the same feeling as him, but but they but they didn't really feel comfortable, you know, talking about it or making it known that that they're uncomfortable racing the oval tracks. So if, from your perspective, how do you feel about oval tracks? Would that be something you'd be interested in, or is the risk just like too too great for you? Uh, no, I would definitely be interested in it. And if I want to go to IndyCar, you know, the 500 is such an iconic race. It's, it's part of the sport and um, I would love to race there one day. So it's, but I, I get what you're saying that it is definitely a very high risk situation with the speeds and the walls being so close that uh, it, it does scare drivers. And I'll be honest, it, I mean, it, it makes you... Um, after, I mean, I haven't been on an actual oval before, but I did get to run, you know, Daytona had part of it, but that was in an MX-5, so it was, it was quite different, it's pretty flat out. Um, but then, like, I ran Homestead in a, in a GT2 car, and we did run, actually, NASCAR 3 and 4, and just, like, they, you, there's sort of this vulnerability in an oval where, you know, you're, you have to be committed to going flat out or close to it, and if anything were to break or fail, or the car gets away from you in an instant, you know, you're, you're pretty, there's not really much saving it. So it's, it's just like getting, um, coming to terms with that fact. But like I said, it's part of the sport. It's just, it is what it is. And you just learn how to deal with it and make it to minimize those mistakes. So you don't end up in that situation. Yes, and that's one of the differences right there between IndyCar and NASCAR on an oval. A NASCAR car on an oval, you get sideways. There's always a chance that, that that you can save it. You'll you'll probably still spin out, but maybe not hit the wall. But in an IndyCar on an oval, when it's turned around sideways, it's gone, and it's a really hard hit. Yeah, I always cringe watching IndyCars crash on oval tracks. It's really massive in comparison to NASCAR. And speaking of the Indianapolis 500, last year was the first time in, I believe, two decades that we haven't seen a woman at the greatest spectacle in racing. Pippa Man, a regular at the Speedway, tried to put together a deal, but it just wasn't meant to be. And along with Pippa Man, over the years, we've seen the likes of Janet Guthrie, Lynn St. James, Sarah Fisher, Danica Patrick, and Simona De Silvestro. There's some to mention right there to compete in this special race. How disappointing was it when you saw the official 2020 Indy 500 entry list and not a single woman was entered in the race? Um, it was obviously very disappointing, uh, especially like for me and, and I like Agrin because we're the two most recent females to race in the road to Indy. And, you know, both of us are sitting there watching Indy 500 happen with no females. And we're both sat there without budgets to even try and begin to compete in a full season of, you know, Indy Pro 2000 or Indy Lights. So 
it was, it's, I mean, it's disheartening and I hope that that, well, I mean, it already is going to change for this year because of, of Simona. So I'm really excited to see how well she does. Uh, I'm sure she's going to do amazing, especially in the Penske car. So uh, I think it's, uh, I, I hope, I don't want to say I know, but I, I hope that we will never see another race again where a female is not present. And you mentioned Simona Di Sylvester, who, who will be making her return to the 2.5 mile oval for the first time since 2015 when she finished 19th with Andretti Autosport. She'll be attempting to make the race driving a number 16 Chevrolet for Pareto Autosport. The pr program led by automotive and motorsports is Ega Beth Pareto, who has experience leading several championship winning programs in 2012, the NASCAR Cup Series Championship with Team Penske and Brad Keselowski when Dodge was still in NASCAR. 2014, the MC GTLM title with the SRT Viper squad and driver Kuna Whitner. In 2014 as well, the Trans Am TA2 Championship with Cameron Lawrence driving a Dodge Challenger. Beretta formed a technical alliance with Team Penske, a part of IndyCar's initiative, Race for Equality and Change. How excited are you about this Indy 500 program, and what does it mean for the future of women competing at the Indianapolis 500? Uh, I mean, it's huge for, for women in motorsports, and especially women in, in IndyCar. Uh, we've never had, you know, a female team owner come in and support an effort like this, and to have Penske support is is massive. And I think that, you know, they understand that the problem, they just fund the, the Indy 500, that the problem isn't going to be solved, that they need to also be supporting and funding and getting involved with the, the feeder series as well, because, I mean, that's ultimately where, where the talent comes from. So I think that they understand the, the larger picture at hand, and it sounds like they're really going to get involved more. So I, I'm very excited to see how it goes. Yes, I yes, I really like IndyCar's race for quality and change. I know they're doing something that else with the team called Force Force India, a young black driver, Miles Rose. So they yeah, so they so they recognize the need to get more diversity on that aspect as well. And also with Beth Peretta and her program with Simona Di Silvestre, it's gonna be really exciting to see what Simona and Peretta are able to do with that Penske Alliance come the month of May. Yeah, speaking about uh, diversity, uh, that, that's the very final topic, Cybre, I promise. And, uh, you also have a female sign on your helmet, uh, which is really cool. So it must also have some sort of, of special meaning to you being a woman in motorsport. Uh, there are certainly more female drivers now compared to like 10 years ago when you maybe started out in, in, in karting. Uh, how do you see things have evolved uh, now in, uh, in, in motor racing worldwide? Yeah, I think after W Series kind of came out, uh, I definitely have noticed more girls being vocal, more women getting involved, being like, hey, yeah, we can do this. So um, it means a lot to me to, to represent women in motorsports and, and just try to inspire young women or old women or just women in or people in general to, to get involved in, in what they love to do. Um, yeah, so I really hope that that, that the numbers are continuing to grow because I've definitely seen more more girls lately. I just saw like in the U.S. national party scene, there was you know three different girls that were in three different podiums throughout the weekend that and the national car race that happened a couple weeks ago, and I was so excited to see that because you know when I was racing, it was really you know it was me and maybe maybe one maybe two others every once in a while. So it's a uh, it's really great to see the numbers that are growing and the, the support that is growing as well. Yeah, definitely. And also the FIA Women in Motorsports Commission, led by the uh, rally legend Michelle Mutoni, is also doing very well. Uh, I think a, a lot of, uh, of very interesting programs like the FIA Girls on Track initiative that brought uh, the, fir the very first female driver in the uh, FDA, in the Ferrari Driver Academy. Uh, all, all these are, are really interesting programs, like also the, the first LMP2 program in, in Le Mans, uh, the Richard Mille Racing, all, all, all coming up very, uh, very exciting for, for female in motorsports and for the, for the sports in general, I would say. Uh, but still, there, there's like that glass ceiling needed to, to be uh, ready to, to break. Uh, where do you see uh, that uh, we should maybe receive more funding? Um, I don't think it's going to be one program. I think it's a matter of getting, you know, big business, big companies to invest in women just as much as they are investing in men. Because there's, I mean, millions and millions of dollars going into sports every year. And a very small fraction of that is being given to women's sports. So I think that is, that's the imbalance that we're really fighting right now is that the big business, the big companies, the big marketing, the big spending has to be, 
either at least proportionally spent on women for big gains to start happening. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the WC 2021, coming to the, the very final question, um, it, it's going to be very exciting for Formula One being on the same platform. Uh, you also met newcomers at the uh, London meeting in 2020 uh, in February. Uh, how do you see, the, the, did you see the, um, the competitive levels for, for maybe for the newcomers and wh where do you, do you see the, uh, the, the new t season uh, uh, going forward? Uh, I think the new season is going to be great. Obviously, being paired with F1 is going to be amazing uh, experience for everyone and just great exposure for W Series and all of us. Um, it's I'm, I'm excited to have new people on the track. I mean, we, we haven't driven with them yet, so I really I cannot speak to how or what the I think they're going to do or how we're going to do compared against the, the new girls. But um, I just hope that everyone has a safe and good season and. I think that it's going to be very entertaining, hopefully for you guys, and uh, that we'll all uh, be still smiling at the end of 2021. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we can see you in, in person in Valencia, the uh, preseason testing. And uh, I'd like to really, really thank you for your time today because uh, I know it's uh, it was a lot of uh, a very long interview. And uh, yeah, I, I thank you so much for your time. and. Uh, Hopefully see you soon. No problem. Thank you guys so much for having me. It was good talking to you. Yes, Sabre. We're so we're so excited to have you join us here for Life Life on the Grid. We definitely encourage all of our viewers to follow Sabre Cook on her social media pages, tw tw Twitter, Twitter, Instagram, everything. Yeah, so definitely once again, thank you for joining us and hope you, and we wish you luck during the upcoming W series season. Thank you so much. Now it's time for our musical cast. She comes from Girdwood, Alaska. She started singing as a child. You can follow her on Facebook. Links in the video description below. Here is Ava Earl. So sit back, enjoy, and thank you for watching this month's episode of Life on the Grid. <laughs>